welcome. You're in for an exciting presentation today. We're excited to bring back the dynamic duo, Dr. Soren Boysen and Dr. Serge Shaloub as they present live. Welcome to Veterinary POCUS, differentiating primary cardiac from pulmonary and pleural space diseases. I'm Jonas Castelgate, VP at Clarius, and we'll be introducing you shortly to your host, Dr. Aron Frankel. First, I'd like to acknowledge the teams at the Vet Show, VEX, and NAFC for inviting so many of you to join us here today. You're among over 4,900 doctors of veterinary medicine who registered for today's educational event. A housekeeping note, you may ask questions anytime during the webinar using the questions box. Our guest experts will answer your questions during the live Q&A session following their presentations. With a jam-packed session today, our live Q&A will begin at the top of the hour. We hope you can stay on with us. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to your host. Trained in emergency medicine in California, Dr. Aron Frankel is a passionate POCUS educator. He currently practices in a busy academic teaching hospital in Vancouver as an emergency physician and also serves as the chairman of our Claris Medical Advisory Board. Welcome back, Dr. Frankel, and over to you. Thanks, Janez. I'm glad to be back as always. And today's topic is one that's actually near and dear to my heart from the human side, which is diagnosing causes of dyspnea uh, with cardiac and pulmonary diseases. You know, in our research background and to set up the conversation for today, we did a bit of a literature review and found some really interesting papers that are going to be highlighted also later, but I kind of wanted to bring them to attention to set the stage. So the first one I wanted to talk about was using point of care thoracic ultrasound for CHF diagnosis. And what's really interesting is in the human world, this has been going on for at least five to 10 plus years in the critical care and emergency literature. And it's great to see it moving into the animal space and the veterinary space as well. And the findings seem to really mirror what we know in the human practice, which is that lung ultrasound is actually highly predictive of congestive heart failure. And it seems to operate essentially on par with the BNP, which like in our practice, sometimes can be a test that requires significant delays. It's not always available in the laboratory, depending on your site of practice. And in animal studies, at least as specifically in this one on cats that was looked at, CHF as highly specific, uh, operating even better often than BNP. And an interesting finding that came out of the ultrasound literature in cats specifically was looking at subjective left atrial enlargement as a really sensitive and specific factor, which I'll leave to our other hosts to talk about, but that it's actually a really helpful technique specifically for beginner sonographers. You know, looking at some of the other literature focused ultrasound, even in occult heart disease, uh, this is in patients, this was a prospective multicenter study, and these are non-specialist practitioners who were trained to perform focused cardiac ultrasound in a point of care environment. And compared to a cardiologist gold standard, even in cats in this patient cohort without known heart disease or symptoms of heart disease, they were actually uh, very sensitive and specific compared to the cardiologist gold standard in detecting cardiac disease. And uh, that only increased with the severity of disease. So once there was moderate or severe cardiac disease, you know, these uh, non-specialist non practitioners were basically operating on par with a specialist with a very focused exam to diagnose occult heart disease. And lastly, just to kind of set the survey, looking at what is point of care ultrasound use across the board by veterinarians, this kind of speaks to topics we've had in prior webinars that at least in Canada, which we think is pretty representative of other well-resourced environments, there is a significant uptake of ultrasound use in the point of care environment by veterinarians, uh, particularly with the abdominal scans. But it's constantly and recurrently addressed that lung and cardiovascular ultra, ultrasound examinations are infrequently performed. And kind of looking at what are the barriers to care is that it comes up over and over again, there's either no machine or a poor quality machine, lack of access to a machine, lack of experience and confidence in the users or lack of training and education of the users, even if there is a machine. So, you know, we can't think of anyone better to really help bridge those gaps and those barriers and get us into scanning the thorax than our special guests, Drs. Boysen and Serge Shalhoub. It's our honor to introduce them again from the University of Calgary Faculty of Veterinary Medicine. Dr. Boysen is a specialist in veterinary emergency and critical care, while Dr. Shalhoub is a specialist of veterinary internal medicine in small animals. They are both recipients of numerous teaching and speaking awards and considered pioneers of veterinary POCUS, having introduced the veterinary profession to the FAST exam through their original study published in 2004, and having a combined total of over 25 peer-reviewed articles and book chapters on the subject. Drs. Boysen and Shalhoub, welcome back and over to you. 
All right. Well, thank you very much. That was a great introduction. We're going to continue to build on what you've already uh, introduced everybody to. Uh, again, I'm Dr. Cern Boyson. And I am Dr. Sir Chaloub. Thank you for joining us in such huge numbers, Dr. Boyson. I think they're all here for all my humor and my jokes. Uh, I don't think they're here for internal medicine, Dr. Chaloub. I think they're here for pulmonary and cardiac ultrasound. All right. Uh, we should just uh, declare that uh, we do not have any conflicts of interest. We do get honorariums for the number of conferences we give, including for Clarius, as well as other uh, companies and conference uh, venues. Other than that, we have no conflicts of interest. Yeah, and thank you for joining us. So we're really going to talk about differentiating primary cardiac from pulmonary and pleural space diseases. Let's look at our specific objective for us today. What's first up? So we are going to review. We uh, talked about this last time. We're going to review pleura and lung ultrasound. And this time we're going to focus that down to using that to help us identify or think about potential cardiac causes of changes in the lung. Okay, I like that. And we're also going to apply cardiac point of care ultrasound to rapidly determine if dyspnea is cardiac in origin. Ooh. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. And then we're going to explain how serial pleural lung ultrasound can be used to potentially help us tailor our furosemide dosage, or if we could stop or need to increase that dosage. So we're going to talk about how we use PLUS to help us with that decision. What? Are you going to tell me there's going to be a therapeutic implication too? Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. Man. That is part of our point of care ultrasound. All right. And then we're going to look at how to interpret dry lung findings in cats presenting with respiratory distress. Dun, dun, dun. So we introduce our case. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. Let's go ahead and use a case to bring this topic to light. So we're going to start with Lego. All right. Lego is a five-year-old male neutered domestic short hair comes in for difficulty breathing. Dr. Boysen, it's 5 p.m. right before the weekend starts. What do we do? Dog, we're cats not eating three days. We're indoor, outdoor. We start listening to this patient and I'm seeing some very concerning things here. Absolutely. So we look at that our patient here. We got a slightly low temperature at 37.2, but not too bad. Heart rate's 192. Again, it's a cat. Mm, not sure if that's that significant or not. Respiratory rate though, 76, Dr. Schloop. Our patient is definitely tachypnic. 76, not normal? 76 is elevated, Dr. Schloop. All right. So we see that the mucous membranes are cyanotic. That's not a normal color that I'm aware of, at least on internal medicine. Thankfully, I don't see that a lot. Marked effort in breathing, Dr. Boys. All right, now I'm getting a little convinced we're in trouble. Yeah, we're not only tachypnic with a fast respiratory rate, we've got dyspnea, Dr. Shalhoub. We're having difficulty with our respiratory effort. And if we listen to our patient, Dr. Shalhoub, what are we going to hear? All right, so we have some harsh lung sounds, crackles, and they seem to be loudest mid-thorax. And uh-oh, I, I can't hear the heart, Dr. Boys. I'm a little worried if I can't hear the heart. Is that... Problem. All right. So something else to note then, difficult to hear the heart when our patient has harsh lung sounds. Interesting point. We'll come back to that as well. But let's go ahead then and move forward, Dr. Shalhoub. What are you thinking at this point? There's a, a cat. This isn't actually Lego. Uh, it's a cat that we showed you last time as well. But this is exactly how Lego was breathing. Look very, very similar to this. Um, at this point, I'm running away, Dr. Boysen, and I'm going to get you because this is your specialty, not mine. All right. So easy. Let's make this as uh, simple as we can. This patient's in respiratory distress. Ah, uh, okay. Yes. I, I can concur with you on that respiratory distress. But now what are the general causes? I mean, as an internal medicine specialist, I have 1,622.6 different differentials are going to come up. All right, Dr. Shalhoub, lots of different things that cause respiratory distress. On our initial uh, triage exam, we had a patient that had respiratory distress, but it's unlikely to be upper airway. That's one of the things we want to look for, upper versus lower airway. And upper airway seems unlikely because we didn't have any skirt or strider. That's something we can usually pick up on our initial triage, where it might be located from an upper airway standpoint. But that does leave us with three big categories that can explain the majority of respiratory distress in our cats, Dr. Schlup. And those would be what? So the three categories are going to be pleural space disease pulmonary disease or cardiac disease. All right, I, I can agree with that, Dr. Boysen. I can simplify, but my question to you is, what, what do we do next? Do we start doing a whole bunch of different uh, tests here, blood work right now? Uh, I believe, Dr. Schlub, when you took your oath to become a veterinarian, part of that oath stated, do no harm. True. So let's start by making sure we keep our patient alive. Let's actually do some stabilization, Dr. Schlup. All right. So we need to put our cat in oxygen. There's no doubt, but he's still pretty tachypnic and he looks really anxious. What do I need to do? So in that situation, we can also provide an anxiolytic, Dr. Schlup. We got to think about whether our patient's in pain or just anxious. Yep. In this case, we're worried about uh, anxiety, increased work of breathing, uh, increased oxygen consumption because of stress. So we give some yeah. butorphanol. And as you can see in this uh, example here, this is a cat before and after butorphanol. You can see that that butorphanol is an anxiolytic, decreases the work of breathing with yeah. oxygen, leave them alone 10 minutes. We can often greatly improve 
the respiratory function of our patients and make them far less stressed. I think you overdid it on this cat, Dr. Poison. It's maybe a little quiet there, but I get the point. The cat's not stressed, decreases work of breathing. So now what I do, Dr. Boys, I'm still left with a bunch of differentials. How do I help myself narrow down the possibilities? All right, and there's lots of things that we're familiar with, and this is from Silver Student Hopper. If we look at cardiac versus pulmonary, when it comes to history and physical exam. Oh, okay. All of us are pretty comfortable and know that the history and the triage physical examination can provide some clues. So let's go through those. Findings suggested of cardiac failure, Dr. Shalhoub, what have we got? Well, if it's cardiac failure more suggested, it's going to be something like sudden onset of clinical science. Cat was normal, 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 and then <laughs> not good. All right. So sudden onset, absolutely. I'm not supposed to rest for everything primary pulmonary, especially something along the lines of, say, asthma, one of the more common uh, pulmonary diseases we see causing respiratory distress in our feline patients. That's usually a more chronic, insidious onset, getting a little bit worse over time. And we'll often, in our cats, see cough associated with that. This is true because cats tend not to cough when they're in congestive heart failure compared to our dog patients. All right. So something else that's suggested more of cardiac failure, these cats might come in hypothermic because da, 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 they're unstable because they're hypoperfused, Dr. Boysen. Now you're getting the hang of it, Dr. That was a nice emergency uh, explanation there for the low temperature. On the flip side, many of our cats that come in with pulmonary disease, they're going to be stressed. They're going to be anxious. They're going to have hyperthermia. Maybe it's infectious in origin. So hyperthermia would be more suggestive of a potentially pulmonary versus cardiac cause. I love it. And I think for our, our patients coming in suggestive of cardiac failure, those cats probably are going to have some kind of cardiac auscultation abnormality, like a murmur or a gallop there, Dr. Bosley. All right. So that's something that we can also see. And in our feline patients that come in with primary pulmonary, non-cardiac related, we say that the odds are that that cardiac auscultation is going to be normal. So no murmur, no gallop rhythm. Yeah. All right. And those patients, again, coming in those cats, cardiac failure, maybe they just underwent recent anesthesia that maybe decompensated them or recent administration of glucocorticoids, also potentially an association. That makes a lot of sense. And a lot of these cats might come in with a lameness. What? Yeah. And that's, again, we're going to think if we had to choose a patient that comes in with respiratory distress that suddenly becomes paralyzed in the back legs, we're thinking aortic thromboembolism, which is most likely to be secondary to cardiac disease. Although we can also see uh, thromboembolic problems from primary pulmonary carcinoma in cats as well from neoplasia. So we're done here with this history, Dr. Poison. I can make a diagnosis and give a treatment because this is 100% accurate. So a good point, Dr. Shalhoub, these are things we all look at. They should be looked at. They will influence our decision for sure. But let's actually take a look at that ward paper that uh, Dr. Oren had mentioned earlier and see how these things lay out. So if we look at the rectal temperature, for example, yep. and we look at our patients with congestive heart failure, 100.3 versus those with non-cardiogenic causes of respiratory distress, 100.4 almost the same number. What? So you bet. We look at it and if it's really low, we might think uh, congestive heart failure, but really, Dr. Shalhoub, the temperature tends to be pretty similar in both situations. All right. Heart rate, though, must be giving us a difference here. And again, if we look at it, there's not a lot of difference. We got 200 in all combined, 194 versus 207. What? So really not that much difference. And again, not statistically significant to help us really differentiate the problems. Well, I got it. I got one that's going to nail it directly, Dr. Boys, in the presence of auscultation abnormalities like a murmur. All right. Now, if I hear a murmur, the odds are I'm going to think more likely cardiac versus respiratory. Yep. And this is true. If you look at the numbers, we've got a higher incidence in cats that have congestive heart failure with murmurs. But that said, Dr. Shalhoub, we also see it in our patients with non-cardiogenic. We still have 10 to 15% of cats coming with respiratory distress and not cardiac in origin that have a murmur. And the other thing, Dr. Shalhoub, how many of the cats with the cardiac uh, disease have a murmur? Um, with the cardiac disease, we have 39.4, Dr. Boys. And that's right. not a lot. So it's pretty specific, what? pretty specific, but not very sensitive. 60% no. are not going to have a murmur, Dr. That's crazy. So wait a minute. We know cats are aliens from outer space, but come on. What about an arrhythmia or potentially a gallop? Same thing. If you look at the numbers here, we won't go through them exactly, but you can see it's not, neither sensitive nor specific at uh, identifying the problem as cardiac in origin. That's crazy to me, Dr. Boysen. So what I'm understanding here from you and for the audience, Dr. Boysen was my professor about 15 years ago. So I have to relearn a bunch of things because he taught me wrong. But what I'm understanding is that we can't rely just on physical exam findings or history findings here. All right, Dr. Shalhoub, it's taking a long time. Some people would pick that up earlier than others. Some students are a little bit slower than others. I won't mention names, Dr. Shalhoub, but you are absolutely correct. And one of the other things that we look at is gallop rhythm again, Dr. Shalhoub, very, very specific only found in patients with congestive heart failure that come in with respiratory stress in this particular study. Yeah. But again, not very sensitive. Most cats wow. aren't going to have a gallop that have congestive heart failure. 
Woo, Dr. Boysen. All right. So what else can we use that could potentially help us differentiate them and help us stabilize those cans faster? All right. Well, let's look at the three big causes we talked about, Dr. Schlubin. Are those things we can pick up with point of care ultrasound? Because that's something that we really mm. want to explore. Can we pick that up? Pleural effusion? Yes, absolutely. There's lots of uh, research now out there out there now in the veterinary profession that shows we can identify pleural effusion with point of care ultrasound. All right. Pulmonary pathology. When we're talking about alveolar interstitial syndrome, the answer is we. Absolutely, we can see that. All right. And the other one, Dr. Shalhoub, then is cardiac disease. Is this something that we can pick up without being a board certified cardiologist? Is this something that a general practitioner can pick up? and uh, apply. And absolutely, this recent study out of Tufts that uh, Dr. Orna mentioned earlier as well, shows that this can be done by non-specialists. So we're going to come back and let's look at all these things then that we might see that help us with point of care ultrasound differentiate a cardiac from a primary pulmonary or plural cause of respiratory stress. Hold on, Dr. Boys. And my patient is dyspneic to kipnic. I, I'm worried that if I sneeze, I'm going to decompensate that cat. How stable does my patient have to be for me to be able to do lung or cardiac ultrasound? Now, that's a great question, Dr. Shalhoub. And if we think about that uh, algorithm we looked at earlier, those differences on physical examination or triage yeah. between cardiac and respiratory, we can see that most of those require us to put a stethoscope on the patient, Dr. Shalhoub, yeah. like you see in the upper left image here. If you can put a stethoscope on, Dr. Shalhoub, you can put an ultrasound probe on. If you can listen, you can look, and there will be no greater stress as to that patient to put the uh, probe on now than there would be to actually listen to it. You can see that in these examples here. We've got a clarius that you can see on the cat here. He's getting oxygen therapy. This is a patient that just came in in some degree of respiratory distress. And we could just reach in there and apply that uh, ultrasound probe without causing that patient any extra stress. Definitely not beyond what you would do with the stethoscope. So if you can hear it, you can see it. And I do believe that's my hand there, Dr. Boys. And I could tell that how smooth my hand is there. That's me doing that. So absolutely it's something you can do, Dr. Boys. But you can even do it in the oxygen cage. Mind you, some people might not look as happy as you are when a patient is unstable, but you know, you're doing ultrasound, so I'll give that to you. And I'll say that when I was at Montreal, I used to bring the radiologist into the ECC setting and actually have them help me scan. And they got to a point and said, why aren't you just doing this? So that it actually made that little light go on and say, you're right, I can reach in. I can do point of care ultrasound. I can evaluate this patient myself in the oxygen cage, no stress. No extra work of breathing, simple thing to get a quick answer. And clearly no stress on your part with that big smile on your face. Okay, so before we move on and we see how good point of care ultrasound is for lung cardiac disease and also um, pleural space disease, we need a bit of a review from last session. Yeah, and this is available at the Clarius website. You can see the link here. We did cover a lot of this last time. We focused on the normal and how to find the correct sites to evaluate when you're doing a pleural and lung ultrasound. Yeah. We talked specifically about pneumothorax. We talked talk specifically about increased B-lines. It is useful to go back and review that uh, session, particularly increased B-lines, because we're not going to spend too much time on that uh, today. We're going to move more into the pleural effusion and some of the cardiac stuff. Yeah, but let's quickly review some key components. First of all, it is extremely important when you're scanning your patient's lung and pleura, you need to think about the lung and pleura boundaries. So there's different boundaries. There's going to be a cranial boundary, dorsal boundary, cauda boundary, and two ventral boundaries. You need to know where those are, Dr. Poison, so that you can make sure that everything in between, in other words, the things you're interested in, is going to be lung. So you put your probe on lung. Absolutely. And then those borders, like you said, dorsal and ventral, fluid falls, air rises. Those are very, very useful borders for us as well to help us know where that fluid and pathology is going to accumulate in our patient, whether it's in sternal or standing, which brings up the next point, Dr. Schlup. That's correct, Dr. Boysen. So we talked about lung and pleural borders. Now we got to think about patient position, how that affects pathology. So if I have a patient that is sternal or standing, we have air that's going to rise and gray there, fluid that's going to fall. You don't even have to memorize that. If you just think about those principles, you'll know where to put the probe, especially if you know where your boundaries are compared to a patient in lateral. Absolutely. Then the widest point, non-gravity becomes a site where air is going to accumulate. And the widest point, gravity dependent, is where the fluid is going to accumulate. Two different locations from where our patient would have those pathologies and a standing position. I love it, Dr. Boysen. And of course, remember that you got to scan your patients in the most comfortable position they are in to keep them as stable as possible. Look at this kitten here, Dr. Boysen. Absolutely. We had to actually, the only way we could scan a kitten, if you've ever tried to do that, in this case, we had it standing up. It's not the normal position to scan in, but that's the only position we could get good windows. And we then considered how gravity affects air and fluid and knew where to put the probe because we were thinking of pathology and patient position and scanning in the position that we could. I love it, Dr. Boysen. Wait, what? Quiz? What? All right, let's quiz you, Dr. Shalhoub. Normally we might do a poll at this point, but let's keep things rolling. 
Dr. Shalhoub, my question for you, do all cats presenting with dyspnea have abnormal pleura and lung ultrasound findings? Hmm. I'm going to say no, Dr. Boysen, because I feel I have seen some cats that come in for dyspnea and they have normal plus findings. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. And there's a couple of main things that might cause a patient to have a normal lung ultrasound. If we look at the X-ray on the right here, this patient has a mass in the uh, lung, this cat. It certainly could cause some respiratory difficulty, but because that mass, as you see the little yellow arrows there, does not reach the lung surface, we're not going to see it with lung ultrasound. Right. Lung ultrasound is a surface imaging technique, actually. Yeah. It only detects what gets to the surface. And we think about those feline asthma patients coming in with pretty severe bronchial patterns and bronchial inflammation. A lot of those cats, that point of care ultrasound is going to be normal for them, Dr. Boysen. So again, another subset of population, they're going to come to dyspnea to kidney and we're going to have normal. But that's good for us because we potentially rule in and rule out things based on plus findings. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. So there are situations where it will be normal. Now, next question for you, Dr. Shalhoub. What are the chances dyspnea cats presenting for left-sided congestive heart failure. So those coming in with respiratory distress, difficulty breathing, it's because of congestive heart failure. What are the chances those cats will have abnormal plus findings? Can you repeat the question? So <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm just going to say yes, Dr. Boysen. I'm going to commit to yes, they're going to have abnormal plus findings more so than not. Absolutely. And the reason why you think about the pathophysiology beside left-sided congestive heart failure, if that's bad enough, they come in with respiratory distress, that distress from heart failure is because they've got fluid in their lungs or they've got fluid in the pleural space. All right. And those are both things that we can identify with pleural lung ultrasound. And you can see what will scan in S-shaped lung regions on the left to check for those wet lung or those V-lines in the lungs. And we'll come back to that. And on the right, you'll see that we can look for pleural effusion. And we'll talk about that as well. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. 100% cats are aliens from outer space. And they not only like to have left-sided congestive heart failure and pulmonary edema, they like to make that pleural effusion too, Dr. Boysen. And like you said, we can pick that up. So if a cat presents for dyspnea due to heart failure, it will have positive plus findings, Dr. Boysen. I like that. All right, so we're gonna start scanning. Let's start with the lungs. One of the best organs ever, Dr. Schlue. That says the best. And so I think you're it lying to me. best here. organ ever. Because the best organ is the kidneys. The audience knows this from previous webinars. And as I've said multiple times on previous webinars, you can rip both kidneys out. You don't even get sick for 24 hours. You will not die for at least 72 hours. I've, I've asked You for can't this. live without the lungs, Dr. Schlue. You rip those out, you'd be dead in an hour. Did your daughters put those stars around? Because that's very right, artistic. Moving on. Okay. So moving on, Dr. Boysen, we have a cat here and we start the probe at the most caudal dorsal portion so that we can scan the lung in a systematic S-shaped fashion. And so we're up here, Dr. Boysen, I see a pleural line and I see a glide sign right there, which means I can interpret everything below as lung. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. But at this first site, this was actually Lego uh, that we ultrasounded here. Oh. And you can see that in this situation, what do you think? Normal or abnormal at this site, Dr. Shalhoub? Well, I can interpret everything as lung because I see a glide sign. I don't see any B lines there, Dr. Boysen, or pleural effusion. So I'm going to say this is a small snippet of normal lung. Excellent, Dr. Shalhoub. I 100% agree with you, but we don't want to stop there. Look at all those lightsabers, Dr. Boysen, B lines. So we have to... <laughs> What we that? have to scan for rays of sunshine from the heavens, Dr. Salou. So if you look at the other sites, we've got multiple sites that we're going to scan here. And as you can see, that first site we scanned was not too remarkable. But as we move to other sites, this stresses the importance of multiple regions and multiple sites to scan. You can see that we have multiple B lines here that are starting to coalesce. We got multiple B lines here and we got multiple B lines here. So we've this patient here has three sites, four sites on this side of the chest, plus the other side of the chest looks very similar. This patient is positive and has a lot of strong indications of increased B lines in the lungs, Dr. Shalhoub. Why did you take out my lightsaber music, my Star Wars music with a broken record and add something else to it? It's obvious the audience agrees. These are not lightsabers. These are rays of sunshine from the heavens, Dr. Shalhoub. That sounds very morbid because if you see those rays of sunshine, you mean you're closer to heaven, your patient? It, not if you're good in critical care, Dr. Shalhoub. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, team. So back to Lego. And we can see here, Dr. Boys, and I'm looking at this and woof. I see so many beelines in this clip right here. They're coalescing. It gives me a white sheet. And I feel like I can see a little titch of pleural effusion. Now, that's not a skill I would expect our beginner point of care ultrasounders to notice. But I think I see a little bit of pleural effusion there. All right. So we're going to focus on the more obvious thing that you pointed out first, Dr. Shalhoub. We're going to come back to that pleural effusion. Good to know that you suspect it. We're going to talk about that in a little bit, but what do you think 
What are you thinking of when you see that degree of white lung? That is just solid white. Those V lines are so solid. Instead of coming through like nice individual lines, they're so numerous, they start to form a solid sheet. Not so true. increased B lines equals alveolar interstitial syndrome. I think of wet lung. I think that lung has a lot of fluid inside of it, Dr. Boysen. And I would say that the majority of times you see increased B lines, Dr. Shalhoub, increased extravascular lung water, fluid in the lung outside the vascular system. It's the first thing we should think of because it's the most common reason for increased B lines. Look at all the causes, hemorrhage, non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema. There's our buddy, left-sided congestive heart failure. Yep. Fluid overload, ARDS, pneumonia, aspiration. Absolutely. Most patients that come in with increased feline lines will have increased extravascular lung water. But do they always have increased extravascular lung water when we see B lines, Dr. Shalhoub, that are increased in number? Yes. No, Dr. Shalhoub. No. We have dry B lines. Dry B lines. And that's why I think it's a little bit dangerous. We can say that the lungs are dry if we don't see B lines, but to say that it's wet lung all the time is a little bit misleading because really? we can see other things that will do it. Like what? And I like to think of this as decreased aerated lung okay. at the periphery of the lung. So anything that decreases the ratio of air at the periphery of the lung will cause B lines. Fluid will do it for sure. Okay. But we can also have decreased air at the periphery due to fibrosis, inflammatory cells, and neoplasia. Oh. They decrease the aerated ratio at the periphery of the lung and increase the B lines. And the other one that I think is really important to consider, we can also see it, Dr. Shalhoub, with atelectasis, where we just decrease the air in the alveoli because of collapse secondary to that atelectasis. That will increase our B lines as well. Wow. So that's not wet lung, Dr. Boys. And that's like dry B lines. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. It's alveolar interstitial disease. Often we think of causes such as wet lung, but there are things that will cause increased B lines that don't put the water content in the lung up. So what we're hearing from you is we can't just assume wet lung causes. We need to investigate further. Absolutely. We got to think about our patient and the most likely underlying problem based on history, clinical findings, and the whole picture put together. Well, Lego definitely has bilateral alveolar interstitial syndrome. There's like epic Jedi fights going everywhere, lightsabers everywhere, Dr. Boys. But what I'm hearing from you is I can't automatically say that is wet lung. Chances are it is. Correct. Okay. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. And we've done now a complete scan on uh, one side, both sides, actually. We did look at both sides of the lung. We saw multiple B lines, multiple regions on both sides of the chest. So the next question, now we finished our lung scan by yep. that S-shaped pattern looking for uh, lung surface pathology. Are we done, Dr. Shalhoub? Should we look at other things? Should we do a full systemic point of care ultrasound evaluation in Lego at this point in time? Well, I think we should move backwards and look at the kidneys, the bladder, you know, some important organs. So a cat you ran away from because it was in respiratory stress, you were worried about it dying, you now want to stick a probe on and start randomly scanning the kidneys. Yeah. <laughs> Dr. Shalhoub, choose the correct test at the correct time. So a systemic evaluate everything? No, not when the patient's trying to die, not if we're going to stress it. Absolutely might do it, but only when it's stable. So not a total point of care outside evaluation you. at this time. Okay. I realize you love the kidneys, but no, not now, Dr. Shalhoub, not oh. the right time. All right. Once I stabilize that patient, but on an all true team, we can use point of care ultrasound in this stage, particularly potentially to monitor and track how this patient's going to do, especially when we give therapy and see if we have an improvement in our ultrasound parameters. Absolutely. We've got increased B lines. That's an abnormality we've seen now at our baseline value. We can see what those do over time, get better or worse. Yeah. We can also, because we've done that initial uh, triage with our point of care ultrasound, we've seen the increased B lines. You suspected maybe a little bit of pleural fluid there. Yes. We've looked specifically at the lung for signs of alveolar interstitial disease. We've looked for increased B lines. We have not really assessed Lego for pleural effusion, which we suspect but we want to confirm. So we're not done with our triage to explain all of the causes of respiratory stress in Lego yet. Yeah, and to treat or not to treat. Hmm. Uh -huh. And that's, that's one question. where if we see a lot of fluid, for example, Dr. Shalhoub in any cavity, we could potentially do ultrasound guided therapy to relieve that fluid and make that patient better. All right, and for those who weren't in attendance in our first webinar, just go to that link and you can see this. We've explained this step-by-step -step on how we can use point of care ultrasound in these different modalities. Now. Lego, we're wondering if there was a little bit of pleural effusion. So what do I need to do here, Dr. Boys? Yeah, so again, I'm looking at this image here. This is our uh, Clarice image that we have from Lego. And I'm seeing those increased B lines, consolidation. Yep. I'm looking there and thinking, ah, is there a little bit of separation there? I don't is there know. Is there a similar fluid? We are actually quite ventral down here, Dr. Shalhoub, but we got the probe perpendicular to the ribs mm -hmm. and we're sitting about the costal junction. 
Is there a better way for us to look for pleural fluid and how good are we at it, Dr. Schlute? Well, I would think it would be a no brainer. So that's why I don't understand why we're having so much trouble even detecting that fluid there, Dr. Poison. All right, now if I ask people and say, how comfortable are you with an ultrasound probe finding pleural effusion? Almost everybody says, you bet, I can do that. If we look at the literature though, these are some studies that came out. This is by Walters in 2018, looking at the TFAST examination compared to CT. And this was done by uh, ER residents and specialists. They only found moderate agreement between CT and TFAST for pleural effusion. What? 0.53. What? I would have said we're way better. I know, 0.53. The evidence says we miss it. Sorry, Dr. Boys, and that's one paper. Tell me something else. All right, and this is another one that was just published. This is a more recent one that came out in 2021 by the, uh, the crew in the UK. This is by uh, Dr. Laura Cole and her team. And you can see in this one, that blue, another uh, type of lung ultrasound um, scanning technique, looking for pleural fluid and other pathologies. It was really good for a lot of pathologies, as lung ultrasound is, but when it came to looking at CT and that blue for free fluid in the pleural space, again, only 67% of the patients that had fluid on CT were identified as having fluid on vet blue. Dr. Boysen, I'm not understanding. I would think fluid would be so easy to see between the pleura. Could this be a potential issue with how we're applying certain protocols? Absolutely. I believe that has a lot to do with it, Dr. Schlub, is how we've evolved with 20 carol stone over time. If we look at this landmark study that Dr. Alicia Andrew published in 2008. You look at that study, the vast majority of those patients were scanned in right lateral recumbency, Dr. Schlub. Yes. When we're scanning a patient right lateral recumbency, where's that fluid going to accumulate if you had to think about it? Downwards, Dr. Boris, at the widest part down below. Yes, and that is essentially going to be one of the four sites that TFAS looked at in that original study, which is the pericardial site. And if we yeah. come in at the level of the heart from underneath the patient, yeah. we can see, we can see right here, nice still pleural effusion and pericardial effusion. Yeah. Great spot to put the probe in the original study with patients in right lateral recumbency. So what do we need to consider here? So how are we scanning most of our patients with respiratory distress in lateral recumbency? or sternal or standing actually sternal or standing because they do so much wetter for their work of breathing we can provide oxygen for them and they have an easier time absolutely and then if you think about that that original pericardial site we put the probe over the heart where the x is and we get a patient sternal or standing with a small volume of fluid where is it going to accumulate um it's going to be way down there because of gravity dr boys and so we're not even going to be hitting it potentially with that probe location all right and that's where i always say don't be scared to break the protocols Think about the pathology you're looking for. Think about the patient position and know how patient position affects where pathology accumulates. We need to get down to that pericardio diaphragmatic window and along that sternal ventral border to find smaller quantities of fluid. And we'll come back to that. Well, the beauty is you don't have to count ribs here, Dr. Boys, and you find your ultrasound, lung, and pleura boundaries. And then you just think about where that pathology is going to go. And boom, you go through that and you find it. So I like that. But we are talking about the pericardial diaphragmatic window there, Dr. Boysen, because that could be quite a sensitive site to find a fusion period. Absolutely. So we'll talk about this in the uh, previous uh, seminar, but real quick, we'll just follow that curtain sign ventrally and we'll follow it down. And on the left, you can see that that curtain sign, when we transition between thorax and abdomen, yeah. there's always this vertical edge artifact line that we see. Mm -hmm. That's true along the entire border between the thorax and the abdomen. Yeah. With one exception, Dr. Schlute where we put the heart and diaphragm together at the pericardial diaphragmatic window. That's correct. We get a triangle of fat called the mediastinal triangle. We shouldn't mistake that for fluid or mass or anything else. And that is the only place because of that fat that's allowing the ultrasound beams to go through. We see the curvature of the diaphragm there. But this is a great site because this with with no floral effusion, we're going to see the heart, the liver all stuck together, diaphragm, mediastinal fat. Very nice to visualize. Absolutely. So we can find that spot with confidence going from a vertical edge to a mediastinal triangle. And the nice thing here now, Dr. Schlub, if you put some pathology in there, we can easily differentiate. A lot of people say, I have trouble telling the difference between pericardial and pleural effusion. Well, this one's super simple. If you go to that site with confidence and you find uh, the heart and the diaphragm in the same window, we get pericardial effusion like on the left here. That pericardial effusion curves away from the diaphragm. In this example, we still see the mediastinal triangle of fat as well, uh, right there, exactly. Yeah. So we see those same structures and now the fluid curves away from and preserves the mediastinal triangle and away from the diaphragm. On pleural effusion to the right, Dr. Schlub, what happens? The fluid will track up and down the diaphragm, Dr. Bose, and really go to all the nooks and crannies there. So it outlines the diaphragm and not the heart this time. Absolutely. And now we also see one of the things I always look for, do you have the costophrenic recess starting to fill with fluid? Mm -hmm. Absolutely you do. And that's why the diaphragm is visible curving away from the chest wall, which we already said you should not see with the exception of where the heart and the diaphragm are in contact. So really nice place 
to differentiate or identify both pathologies in the same window. Dr. Borzen, this is fantastic. And something else that is awesome is including the subxiphoid. A lot of people are familiar with the subxiphoid site for the abdomen, but actually if you rock that probe into the thorax, you get so much more information, Dr. Boysen. You can see pleural effusion and you can see pericardial effusion. Really nice. Absolutely. So another great spot to differentiate those. This is the cat that we have on the left here. It's got liver, large false form fats. So we know it is a cat that we're looking at. There's our diaphragm. And look at all that pleural effusion tracking along, outlining the diaphragm beyond the diaphragm in this window here. And same thing over to the right, Dr. Schlub. We got the liver. We're coming through. There's our diaphragm. We have a little bit of abdominal fusion there too, just a note out of interest. And look at that fluid. All right, where's it going? Is it tracking the diaphragm and following it? No, look right there. Curves away and follows the apex of the heart. Pericardial versus pleural fusion. Really easy to differentiate at this site here as well. Dr. Boysen, are we stuck with one patient position only? And again, scan the patient in the position the most comfortable. we got three different patients down here, all dogs. Lateral recumbency, easy to find that spot. Sternal with, say, hip fractures, for example, where you don't want to stand the patient up and he's not comfortable in lateral, you can put two tables together, make an L shape and come in from that ventral midline. And you got to see our students here now who are veterinarians uh, who are scanning at the subzipoid site in a standing patient. So you can get this in any position. So Dr. Boysen, if I'm understanding right, if there is a significant amount of pleural effusion, we're going to find it. Absolutely. And again, that's that 50 to 67% of the patients. If there's a significant amount of fluid, we can come in perpendicular to the ribs. We can drop down at the costal cone junction. If it's causing respiratory distress, yes, we're going to see it for sure. Like you see on the uh, schematic here to the left, lots of fluid there. Put the probe anywhere in that ventral third, and you're going to pick that up. All right. But now let's say I got a 15-year-old cat coming in for ain't doing right. And I'm worried to, I want to find even the smallest of pathologies that maybe can give me a clue that something's wrong, like a small amount of pleural fusion. Am I going to potentially see that? So if you look at this uh, schematic here again, Dr. Schlund, I put a little bit of fluid, this I presented as blood, let's say, down here between the lung and the sternum. If I stay at that costal chronic junction, the probe is perpendicular to the ribs. Even if I fan that, Dr. Schlund, what am I going to hit? Lung. Absolutely. And then air is an enemy of ultrasound. I can't see that fluid if I fan from that costal chronic junction. Mm. What's the easiest way for me to slice down and check that out, Dr. Schlund? Well, if you rotate the probe from perpendicular to the ribs to parallel to the ribs, and you can use the ultrasound beams to go dig into those craters down there and go ahead and find that. Absolutely. And the easiest thing to do, turn the probe uh, parallel to the ribs and then just slide down with the probe parallel until you get the sternal muscles filling half your image like we see here to the right. Yep. And when you do that, I'll outline the blue here for orientation where the sternal muscles are. And on the right, same thing. And now you can see that little bit of fluid between that pectoral sternal muscles and the lung that's coming in and out. That is a really nice way to pick that up. Just turn the probe parallel. Yep, I think that is a beautiful thing. And we did a little study for our intern showing that this could be more sensitive to find smaller amounts of fluid. Here's a cat on the right in the x-ray. We couldn't see fluid on the ultrasound on the left. We rotated the probe to parallel orientation. Boom, we see that small sliver of fluid. That could make the difference between a diagnosis of carcinoma lymphoma, for instance, or even something infectious like a grass on Dr. Boyce. Absolutely. So all we had to do is rotate the probe, nothing else, and you can see that fluid there. All right. So Dr. Boyce, in compared to CT, TFAS had okay to good agreement for detection of pleural effusion, but we can do better. Absolutely. We want to make sure, again, that we scan ventrally and caudally between the diaphragm and the heart to help us differentiate the two types of fluid and actually pick that up when it's a moderate to significant amount. We want to turn the probe parallel when it's a small amount. We don't want to overlook it, Dr. Schlue. Yeah. And we want to do that in the ventral regions of the thorax because that will pick up those small amounts of fluid. Yeah, and let's remember to rock and fan the probe while and eventually when you're at the sub foot site because you can catch a lot of things going on in that pleura and um, lung space there just in front of that. So very important. So Dr. Boysen, Lego's been cooking here. We sedated him. He's on oxygen. We know he's, he's got doing a better. He's doing better, but he's got a ton of beelines. We, we need to figure things out and hurry up a little bit. And we saw a little bit of pleural effusion. We've decided to try to confirm that by making our probe more parallel and scanning all the ventral services. And I do believe we have a positive for pleural effusion. Yeah, so pretty simple for us to say pleural effusion here, Dr. Schlieff. If you had to say pleural pericardial, though, we have positive for sure. I'm not so sure. Pleural pericardial. I'm not sure. I see fluid. There's all definitely right. fluid. We agree. But, but what I think I need to do is move to that pericardial diaphragmatic window to then determine what do I have? All right. So here we are. We're on the lung. We're just going to span down and try and put the heart there. We start to see the heart. Let's see if we can get that diaphragm there too. Boom. What are you dealing with, Dr. Loop? Pleural uh, pericardial. Definitely some pleural effusion, Dr. Boys. I'm going to pause it in just a sec. Oh, there it is. There's the still image. And we can see that fluid tracking up and down the diaphragm. It's not making, there's not a sac around the heart there, Dr. Nope. And again, if I look to my favorite spot, the costophrenic recess, there it is actually filling that costophrenic recess and pulling the diaphragm, allowing it to be seen. 
curving away from the chest so, wall. So hold on, Dr. Boysen. I need to regroup here. Let, let's have a All little right. powwow. I'm an internist. I need I need time. Let's re, re, recap, Dr. So he's got lots of beelines, correct? He does. I 100% agree with you. Albion syndrome. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. We don't know the cause yet. Probably, if we play the odds, it's going to be wet long. Oh, that's okay to say. Probably. Okay. But we're going to have to actually do more investigation to confirm that. And now he's got pleural effusion. I also agree with you, Dr. Shalhoub. Based on what we've seen with Lego, we have alveolar interstitial disease and we have pleural effusion. So what's going to cause that, Dr. Shalhoub? You're an internist, I, I, right? Correct? Y yes. All Dr. right. Morrison, I, I, All right. Were you questioning my credentials? So sir? tell me what you're thinking, you're... man. You've got increased B-lines, alveolar interstitial pathology, and a bit of pleural effusion. What would cause that? I don't think it's going to be chronic kidney disease. So let's talk about the main possibilities. We're going to have left-sided congestive heart failure probably is our number one, number two, and number three here. At this point in time, I would agree with you, Dr. Shalhoub. We've also got a uh, possibility, maybe we've got some effusive pulmonary neoplasia that might cause increased B lines and pleural effusion if it's uh, ex, uh, exudative. Yeah, I mean, it could be some pneumonia, right? I mean, pneumonia can be very inflammatory. So you're going to have, you know, the fluid in the lungs, but potentially also pleural effusion, yeah. a little bit like cows. Yeah. Bosom, this right? is quite a bit, but uh, probably a little less that we might see in our small animals, but possible. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there are some other things that'll do it too, but uh, we got our top differential then is that left-sided congestive heart failure. So what do we do next, Dr. Boysen? Should we send this patient to a cardiologist? I mean, there's like a month long waiting time here to see a cardiologist. Is that the next step? All right, so let's come back and say, okay, we're comfortable looking at the lungs. We're comfortable looking at the pleural space. What about looking at the heart? Let's go off the other best organ ever, Dr. Schlup. You heard it here, it's recorded. It's in our seminar, lungs are the best along with the heart. Um, All right, let's go ahead and look at the heart then. I'm going to make sure that our editing team just erases this, just this portion and cut. And then we're going to restart right here, okay? All right, team, let's talk about feline cardiac point of care ultrasound pearls. As you've already heard us say, this is not something, we're not going to teach you how to be a cardiologist, a specialist cardiologist, but you using point of care ultrasound, you can potentially diagnose an enlarged left atrium if it's enlarged and put all the signs together and treat this cat for congestive heart failure and stabilize it. Yes, and the reason why, Dr. Shalhoub, if a cat presents for dyspnea due to heart failure, that left atrium is going to be greatly enlarged. Mm -hmm. And the left atrium is all we really need to, in our initial workup, figure out whether we should give furosemide and if the underlying cause of respiratory stress is due to cardiac nature or not. So again, we come back to this study here. This is by Ward again. When we look at congestive heart failure, Okay, and we look at the LAO in cats coming in with respiratory stress. So they come in as a cause of respiratory stress, secondary to congestive heart failure. What was the size of the LAO? So left atrium to aorta ratio, two to one to one. So two to one, essentially. Let's just round it up to two to one. That's impressive. That left atrium was twice the size of that aorta. Dr. Yeah, so if they come in with respiratory distress, secondary congestive heart failure, that left atrium is massive, two to one, Dr. Shalhoub. All right. On average. I can do that. Let's look at our non-cardiogenic causes then. 1.2 to one, essentially normal. Okay. Uh, if they come in for respiratory stress and it's not due to congestive heart failure. All right. And the other thing, Dr. Shalhoub, this is the interesting part that I love. This study also looked at a subjective assessment of the left atrial aortic enlargement. So if we look at that subjective, you can see that 97% of the time, you don't have to measure it. You're not looking for that 1.55 to one, really? 1.47 to one. Subjectively, you can look at that left atrium, compare it to the aorta, and 97% of the time, you can accurately make the call. Now, keep in mind, this was done, this subjective assessment was done by a cardiologist, but they also used a 1.5 to one ratio. So you can see that you're gonna have a higher sensitivity and specificity if you start to decrease the size of the left atrium that you look for relative to the aorta in our patients with congestive heart failure. But that's going to actually increase your sensitivity and specificity. But think yeah. in mind then, we're looking for something that to start, we want something very, very specific. We're going to look for that ratio at two to one is where we recommend you start. Yeah. So for our novice point of care ultrasounders out there, two to one, ALAAO is a great place to start and enough to definitely say that this big to kidney patient with tons of B lines to cat. LAO grade than two to one, you're likely congestive heart failure. Exactly. And if you get better and better, you can decrease the ratio you look for and increase your sensitivity to pick that up. All right. Now, I heard about something about fitting a bunch of aortas in the left atrium that could potentially visually help us immediately tell us if that left atrium is enlarged. What is that? Yeah. So this is that study we came back to as well that Dr. Orna mentioned uh, out of Tufts, the birthplace of point of sound. And you can see that that focus cardiac screen in non-asymptomatic cats. So they actually said these up, these are done by general practitioners yeah. in asymptomatic cats. So what they did was they looked for a large left atrium based on the fact you could fit more than 2.5 or aorta areas within that left atrium. Interesting. So, so very, very interesting. But again, these are asymptomatic. And if your yeah. patient comes in with respiratory sex, 
secondary to congestive heart failure, we've already said your left atrium is going to be very large. Yeah. So we tell people again to start at a four to one. Can you fit four aortas into that left atrium when you're starting in terms of area? And we'll show you an example of that. And then as you get better, you can drop lower and lower towards that uh, 2.5 range. Did I hear you say Tufts was the birthplace of pointy ultrasound? And that's where you did your residency. That is correct. Dr. John Rush, I would say, is the reason that point of error ultrasound was initially introduced into the veterinary profession. So that first point of care ultrasound paper published in the 50s, that's you. <laughs> that is the crew out of Tufts, Dr. All right. Just showing your age. I just wanted to show that. And also, Dr. Boysen, we could look at a long axis of the heart in a cat and measure that left atrium in any which way. We're going to show how that's done. But if it's greater than 16.5 millimeters in diameter, that is indicative of enlarged left atrium. Again, here indicating we need to do something. Yeah. And again, it comes down to if they're in respiratory distress because of left side of congestive heart mm -hmm. failure, that left atrium is going to be big, 16.5 in any way you measure it in that left atrium. All right. right. So let's talk about cardiac point of care ultrasound, Dr. Boys, and something we enjoy very much. There's three key windows we're going to look at, two that are in short axis, two are the main ones. The first one we're going to look at is the mushroom view, which is left ventricle, right ventricle, and often our starting point, especially when you're starting to learn point of care ultrasound to get this down. What else do we call this? All right. So this is the mushroom view, Dr. Shalhoub, because it looks just like a mushroom. The left ventricle looks like a mushroom if you're at the right level and see the papillary muscles. And just above that, we stack crescent-shaped, moon-shaped uh, right ventricle. And then if we actually get to that point, Dr. Shalhoub, this is an important landmark. At that point, we'll find that fish mouth. We'll show you that in a second. And then we'll fan out. And this is the key one, Dr. Shalhoub. What does the left atrial aortic size and ratio look like? That's the Mercedes and the whale. Yeah, absolutely. Sometimes that whale looks like a tadpole and it's a little smaller or, or either potentially a pregnant whale when it's very, very big or a beach whale, right? So very important. And also when you get more comfortable, you can look at the long axis, which is often the four chamber view there that we see down there. And we'll show you how we can get there. But the reality is 90, 95% of the time, especially when you're starting out, just using those two short axis windows, you're going to be golden. Absolutely, Dr. Schlup. So let's actually break this down and go through it step by step. we got an x-ray. We'll superimpose the heart on this cat. We start down here as low as we can. We're at the apex of the heart, Dr. Schlup. The left ventricle extends further ventrally than the right ventricle. So we're only going to chop through the left ventricle here. And you can see that to the right. We're only going to get that left ventricle because we're way down at the apex. You need to be comfortable going from the apex to the base. 100%. And as you sweep up the heart, what you start getting is slowly but surely you get the true mushroom view where you get the left ventricle and the right ventricle view there. And you're going to see the papillary muscles as well. That's how you know you're in a proper left ventricle, right ventricle view there, Dr. Boysen. When you're there, you probably want to go just a little bit higher up, sweeping up the heart, because sooner or later, you're going to come to this window, which is the blah, 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 blah window. That is the fish mouth. And if you're ever on clinics with Dr. Shalhoub and he's got the ultrasound probe with him, you will hear him suddenly scream that out in the middle of clinics when he finds that fish mouth view. So this is the fish mouth view. It's very, very important because at that point, you know, if you go just a little tiny bit more dorsal, and we'll do that by fanning the probe. So once you hit that fish mouth view, you'll just fan a tiny little bit. It'll drop you onto that left atrial aortic ratio. So when you hear the sound of the fish, you freeze and then you just fan a little bit. And there you are, Dr. Boysen. I love it. And then if you wanted that four chamber view, long axis of the heart there, you come back to mushroom and you're going to rotate your probe 90 degrees. This is definitely more challenging to get Dr. Boyson. Absolutely. So we always tell people 95% of the time we can answer the questions we need to on the ER with just the short axis. So here's another example of that. We've labeled everything, the left ventricle, right ventricle, left ventricle, free wall, septum. This is a cat to the left that you can see if it's just a small movement, there's our fan. And all of a sudden you're right there at the left atrial aortic ratio. So it's really millimeters. It's not a lot of movement that you need to do to scan. And then if you do want that four chamber duct schlub, you'll drop back down to the mushroom like you see here and rotate 90 degrees. That drops you on the left ventricle, left atrium, right atrium, right ventricle, the four chamber view. Yeah, and cats often will put the probe right at the sternum and you won't need to sweep much compared to a large dog where you need to sweep up and down the heart. And cats, it might actually be a little bit easier. So Dr. Boysen, we need to talk about that LAAO. How in the world are we measuring this to get a ratio? All right, so we can see the aorta, left atrium. Don't confuse the pulmonary vein as part of your left atrium. So this is a little bit controversial, but we draw a line across to eliminate that uh, pulmonary uh, vein so that we don't measure that as part of our left atrium. There they are outlined, Dr. Schlue. We'll put a yellow arrow in the uh, aorta. We'll superimpose that same thing in the left atrium. You can see that this ratio is about one to one. Yeah. So if it's greater than two to one, if that left atrium is twice the side of an aorta and a dysmic tachypneic cat with tons of beelines, you're in congestive heart failure. Absolutely. All right. I like that. And again, like we talked about, you can fit four aortas in that left atrium. 
you should think about uh, left atrial enlargement. And again, coming back to congestive heart failure for that cat. Did you draw those red circles, Dr. Boisin? They look a little squiggly. I think I did a great job of replicating the area of the aorta in the left atrium. Dr. Schlieb, been showing that you can't fit more than two and a half in there. I, uh, I think, I think you failed good. arts and crafts when you were in high school. I think there's no doubt about that one. So again, Dr. Boisin, let's talk about that four chamber view. What do we got here? All right, so same thing when we're looking at that uh, left atrium in the four chamber, we pick that up. And then if it's greater than 16.5 millimeters in any direction, so you can see you can measure it in any direction here. If it's greater than 16.5 and a patient that comes in with dyspnea, sensitivity and specificity is 87% for left side congestive heart. Yeah, and that cha shape changed as well, the left atrium. Yeah, it gets, it gets more circular instead of square as the left atrium gets yeah, bigger. Too. Exactly, I love that. All right, Dr. Boysen, let's apply this. So triage, we got two, we've got two cats that come in, Dr. Boysen, we got one here and I'm gonna close your eyes, don't move, don't move. And I'm gonna ask you, is this LAO greater than two to one, yes or no? I look at that and I say, that is normal, Dr. Shalhoub. That left atrium is not greater than two to one. It looks like one to one to me. How many aortas can you fit in there? Uh, not more than two. Okay, with your bad drawings, I would agree with that. All right, I'm gonna do it again, close your eyes. Triage, cat comes in, it's dysmic to kipnic. This is what you get on the heart. Whoa, I can see the aorta up there and that left atrium looks way bigger than that aorta, Dr. Shalhoub. I can fit at least two width-wise across that left atrium and I can probably fit six within there. I would have said 16, but that's good, Dr. Boisin. You could fit many aortas in that left atrium. So that left atrium is enlarged, Dr. Boisin. All right. I like that very much. So when is this most helpful? All right, Dr. Shalhoub, let's put this into clinical context. Two cats present with dyspnea. Okay. okay. They have long off findings as seen here, Dr. Shalhoub, increased felines. We have alveolar and interstitial disease. Big question I have, is that aspiration pneumonia? Could that be ARDS? Could that be congestive heart failure? Now I see that I've got beelines there. Let's go ahead and look at the heart, Dr. Schlute. You really don't think those look like lightsabers? Rays of sunshine. Luke, I am your heavens. father. No. All right. So we have the two cats here, cat number one and cat number two, Dr. Boisen. Are you asking me what I need to do here? Which cat gets frozen? All right. I'll ask you the question, Dr. Schlute. Comes in with beelines. We're worried about congestive heart failure versus other alveolar interstitial disease. Which of the two cats, number one or number two, based on the left atrial aortic assessment, would you give furosemide to? Dr. Bozen, that whale in number two is beached. It's huge. That whale's not going anywhere. That is a huge left atrium. It needs furosemide stat. All right, Dr. Schlieman, what about the one at the top? Would you give that patient furosemide? No, Dr. Bozen, that left atrium is quite normal. If anything, it might actually be a little small podcast for another day. Um, but I would look for another cause of alveolar interstitial syndrome here, potentially pneumonia in this cat or potentially even neoplasia, et cetera, et cetera. Absolutely. So other causes of increased felines because this isn't due to congestive heart failure. 100% agree with you, Dr. Shalhoub. Wow, that's pretty rare, Dr. Boisin. All right. So if we look at Lego, Dr. Shalhoub, you can see that we have the aorta down here in the bottom clip. That's... And we have the left atrium. We froze it here just to make it a little easier. What do you think? Would you give this, would you give furosemide to Lego based on this uh, ultrasound clip? That you Dr. See? Boisin, I could fit 6,000 aortas in there. That left atrium is definitely enlarged. Lego is getting furosemide immediately. All right, I concur, Dr. Schlub. Once All again, right. we are in agreement today. Which is pretty rare, Dr. Boysen. All right, let's move on, Dr. Schlub. We can see we've got two, we've got six. Definitely enlarged left atrium for sure. All right, so, but I want to ask you something. Let's say I gave my first furosemide dose. And how do I know if it's working? Do I need to give more, or less? Do I need to put it on CRI? What, how, how is point of care ultrasound going to help me here? All right, and that's where we can track things seriously, Dr. Schlub. We look at B lines and the severity of progression. One beeline, if it's due to the same underlying disease, let's say uh, congestive heart failure is an example. Yeah. You got a patient that has congestive heart failure and he's only got one beeline, then that patient is doing extremely well. As your extravascular fluid increases because of congestive heart failure or other problems, the number of beelines goes up. So you can see from left A, B, C, we're going from one to multiple to coalescing. Ouch. That means as we go from A to B to C, we've got increased extravascular lung water in our lungs if that's due to a cause of wet B lines. All right. But let's say I'm starting with Lego and he's got coalescing B lines over there and I give furosemide and potentially give another dose of furosemide. Are you telling me I'm going to see less and less B lines? So if your patient is furosemide responsive and you're actually getting a response to uh, furosemide therapy in that patient with congestive heart failure, absolutely. Then we'll actually see the amount of fluid in the lungs decreasing over time. Wow. And you can see it actually goes down to A there. And in that case, we can actually decrease our dosage if we're wondering, can we give a bit more and we're staying at sea and we're not responding, then we got to think about adding another uh, diuretic on board or maybe increasing our doses or going to CRI. So absolutely, the number of B-lines correlates to the degree of extravascular lung water, which if the patient's responding to furosemide will decrease over time. And there was a nice canine study that was demonstrated uh, by uh, Dr. Ward and her team again 
with regards to furosemide and beelines and response to therapy. Wow, I love this, Dr. Bozen, because at least we know objectively if our furosemide is working, how much we can give, and we don't have potentially overdose them and hurt those kidneys. Absolutely, Dr. Should bring the kidneys back in, and I'll agree with you on that one as well. All right, so some take-home messages, feline cardiac versus respiratory disease. If you see anechoic material on your point of care ultrasound between two pleura, that's going to be pleural effusion. There are many, many causes of that. Cardiac is one of them. Depending on how much effusion there is, you may want to perform thoracocentesis unless you are originated the problem somewhere else. And then also look at the heart there, Dr. Bozen, to see if it's cardiac in origin. Absolutely, Dr. Shalhoub. Same thing. We got increased bee lines. It means we got interstitial alveolar disease. Mm -hmm. Good chance it's heart failure. Good chance it's wet lung. But like we said, there are other causes of increased bee lines that aren't due to increased water in the lungs. Yep. And we got to rule out other primary lung pathology. All right. Well, what about when we have left atrial enlargement, Dr. Bozen? Now you're talking, Dr. Shalhoub. So when we see pleural effusion and or increased bee lines, we look at that left atrium. If it's enlarged, heart failure is very, very likely start therapy. So what about in that case where we don't have pleural fluid, we don't have bee lines, we have a dysmic tachypneic cat, and we have a normal LAAO? What? All right. So now we've ruled out congestive heart failure because the LAAO is normal and we're not seeing bee lines. And we already said cat with respiratory distress, like the congestive heart failure is going to have increased bee lines. So we got to think about things that aren't going to cause wet lung. We got to about things that won't cause increased bee lines at the lung surface. And in that situation, the biggest thing that we'll probably think of first and foremost in our cat stock schlub in that scenario is going to be asthma. I love we'll probably it. go ahead if we have a history that supports that, that cough, that's why that history again is pretty important. We'll go ahead and start therapy for it. As soon as our patient's sufficiently stable, we can then move ahead with the radiograph. I love it. So in summary, cardiac versus pulmonary cancer presented with dyspnea due to congestive heart failure will have likely, very likely abnormal plus findings. Absolutely. We're going to see increased B lines and pleural effusion if they're coming in for respiratory stress secondary to heart failure. I love it. So we're going to see B lines, pleural effusion. And like we talked about, that left atrium is going to be enlarged. Greater than two to one, Dr. Boys, in short axis. Yeah, exactly. Or greater than 16.5 and long axis in the patient with respiratory stress should be thinking congestive heart failure, heart failure, heart failure, heart failure, heart failure. Or if you like the how many aortas can you fit in the left atrium, you can look at the aorta area in the left atrium. And on that, we're going to leave it open to questions. A huge thank you so much. Our email's on the bottom. If you ever have any questions or cool cases you want to share with us. Absolutely. You can send those to us. And uh, I will say if uh, we do tend to talk pretty quick in our seminars, if you want some more information, uh, we do have a book that should be coming out at the end of October that is just focused to floral space and lung ultrasound. That's it. So we're just getting into the nuts and bolts of the uh, floral space and lung ultrasound. That book should be coming out. Uh, we're writing that with Dr. Gomerin for Belgium as well. Should be coming out uh, in the next month or so. And on that, we're going to say a huge thank you so much. Take it back, team. Yeah. All right. Fire any questions you have. I see there might be some in the Q&A. Hey. Yeah, they're coming. Thanks so much, Dr. Boyson and Shalou. We are going to do a quick demo with our last few minutes uh, before we hang it over to Janez to take it home. And please use the Q&A uh, to fire off your questions. And we'll go a bit over time and stick around to answer your questions. This is most talk here. I wanted to do a quick demo of the lung scan. We can turn in sideways a little bit. Yeah. Uh, this is from our last webinar, but this is kind of where you guys recommend to start. And we've got a dog. I know a lot of the focus today was cats, but it's sort of the same principle, right? So if you can talk me through this, I've done a lot of scans on humans, um, but animals are still pretty new to me. So I, I know you kind of start up here in the armpit area, the right indicator towards the head. Let's see what we got here. There we go. Okay, so All right, there, we, there go. we go. Here I am. And now I'm kind of, I see what looks pretty familiar. Like uh, we've got rib shadows coming down and this is Absolutely. plural line at the top. Yep, that is exactly 100% right. correct. That is here's our some A line. Line. Yep. Yeah, great. And what I'm gonna do, is there maybe like a scattered B line in there, but uh, mostly A line dominant pattern is what I would call it in a human at least. Absolutely, 100% right. agree. And an occasional beeline would be normal, just like in people as well. And if you slide right. up, just like you are, caudally, again, we got the pretty thick hair coats. So you might have, yeah. to have to pull the skin with you a little. Like hair. Um, yeah. And if we. This is uh, the part from scanning humans. I'm not used to all the hair parting. <laughs> but you got to get down to the skin here. There we go. Yeah. And then you just yeah. kind of follow the scan down. Yeah, great. And if you slide. And you guys uh, emphasize. You emphasize in our last webinar, so that seems pretty straightforward. And then kind of finding those, uh, the boundaries, ventral, which I, I don't want to use time, but kind of finding the boundary and then doing sort of the Z, the Z scan all the way down, right? Absolutely. To, to the so, most yeah, so essentially, you've gone to the, the 
caudal dorsal area where you can look for things like pneumothorax and the standing patient, right. and then you're scanning multiple lung surface regions. Uh, and a great job right. picking up the uh, bat sign and the lung there. Excellent. Perfect. Yeah, That's nice. exactly great. right there. Uh, great. For the cardiac scan, I, we wanted to kind of demo that too. I'm going to hand it over to you guys to show right. us a quick demo. I will uh, stop the share screen here. All right, so simple. All we're going to do is our dog standing. That's the more realistic position we're going to scan in. Surge will pull the right limb a little bit forward. It makes it a little easier. We'll apply uh, our gel alcohol, combination of gel and alcohol in this situation. And then we're going to put the marker towards the, uh, the elbow. Nice. And all we're going to do then is find the heart. So you can see that we got the heart here. Uh, Luna's actually very good. So we've got the mushroom view there. Uh, you can see the heart beating there nicely. Uh, and if I actually fan that a little bit, there's my fish mouth. Blah, 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 blah. Thank you, Dr. Schlu. And a little bit more. And there's my left atrial aortic ratio. Uh, so we can see that Luna has a normal left atrium. It's very small. Come back, we get back to that fish mouth. We come back, we get to that mushroom view. And at that spot there, if I really wanted to, I can turn it to the probe parallel to the ribs. And then I get that four chamber view where the left ventricle is in the far field, right ventricle in the near field. And I can also pick up that left atrium there as well. So again, a really nice window for us. And again, we're not cardiologists, so we're not oh. looking for perfect measurements. You got a, a patient that's in a, say, a standing position, which would be a tougher position to scan in normally. But again, we're just worried about the things that we want to try and answer on emergency. So we're actually just going to pick up that mushroom, like you see right there, and through that fish mouth, Dr. Shalhoub, blah, 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 blah. and then onto that left atriotic ratio. So again, we are not uh, cardiologists. We're not putting them on the right side. This is how we scan most of our patients in the emergency room. We scan them in a standing or sternal position. And then again, there's my four chamber yeah. where I get the left ventricle and left atrium in the far field and the right ventricle in the near field. Definitely something that everyone can do. It just takes practice. And you can see we did that in literally 20 seconds by putting Lula Cyprus on the table and scanning uh, in both short and long axis. So really simple to do. Hopefully you can see that on the demo, but uh, definitely something that is super simple and easy to do. Great, thanks so much, guys. Uh, let's hand it back over to Janez to take us home. And then please, everybody, uh, we know we have a lot of people here with a lot of questions. Uh, stick around. We have about 15 minutes uh, where we can stick around and answer your questions, too. So please hang on, and we'll give it back to Janez. Thank you, Drs. Boyson and Shaloub, for sharing your best practices with us today and for such a dynamic and practical presentation. I'd like to share a note from one of our participants, and there are dozens and dozens of notes. I love this. So helpful. So thanks for all your questions and comments. We will start the live Q&A session shortly, so please do stick around for that. First, I'd like to pull up a quick poll to see if you'd like more information about uh, Clarius HD Bet, which you saw in action today during the live demo. Uh, for the highest definition wireless ultrasound imaging to speed diagnostic diagnostics for small, medium, and large animals. So we'll just pull up the poll here and you can ask for any information that you want. It is offered in over 90 countries. So you can get local pricing. You can speak to one of our experts. We can book a live demo and you can see it in action. We can discuss features or you can go ahead and book more tutorials. I'll just tell you while you're answering this poll a bit more information about the micro convex vet scanner, the C7 that you saw today. It's especially designed for clear clinical imaging for small and medium animals like cats and dogs. We also have the C3 convex for larger animals and the L7 vet for equine MSK. Our family of vet scanners deliver several advantages. They're unrivaled for high resolution imaging in a handheld ultrasound with dedicated animal presets, showing you the fine detail you need to quickly investigate an area of concern and to make a confident diagnosis at the bedside with your patient's first visit so you can get them on that right treatment plan. Each scanner has eight beam formers and 192 elements to deliver the image quality and performance only found in traditional systems, but at a fraction of the cost. Artificial intelligence replaces complex knobs and buttons, making our scanners fast and easy to learn and use. Your Claria scanner comes with a free ecosystem with zero subscription fees that include free friendly apps for your iOS or Android devices with free upgrades, unlimited cloud storage to capture and manage your exams and for unlimited users at no additional cost. We, it comes with Clarius Live for one-click telemedicine, so you can share live scanning with a colleague for second opinion. And it's wireless with zero footprint for high portability to scan animals anywhere they are without um, having wires uh, distress your animals and without having to move your patients in distress. Uh, also making it so much easier to clean and disinfect. With increased ultrasound billings, you'll see a rapid return on your Clarius HD vet scanner, which is ultra affordable. Now, 
Now, um, we're just going to close this poll in three, two, one. We will get back to you in the coming week. Um, and uh, we'll also be sending you several resources, including a link to today's webinar recording, a PDF of the slides, and some VET ultrasound video tutorials. Today's program has been submitted for one hour continuous education credit in jurisdictions that provide race approval. Once approved, you'll receive an email link to the VET Show website to enter your license number and contact information to receive a certificate for one CE CPD credit. To qualify, you have to attend at least 50 minutes of today's presentation. So please do stay on with us for the live Q&A if you happen to join late. Now, just one last poll. We'd like to invite you to save your seat for our next webinar, Practical Small Animal Ultrasound. Scanning the pancreas and adrenals for common pathologies. And we'll be welcoming back Dr. Camilla Edwards in this webinar. She'll teach rapid, low impact focus techniques to confidently diagnose pathology common to the pancreas and adrenal glands. Uh, three more seconds to save your seat, two, one. Now on to our live Q&A. Please use the Q&A icon in the menu bar to ask your questions. We've got dozens and dozens. Um, I'd like to welcome back Drs. Boyson and Shaloub. And Dr. Frankel, if you would moderate our session, please. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Uh, we're going to try and fire through as many as we can. If we don't get to them today, we will certainly follow up with your questions afterwards so everyone will get an answer. Uh, first one, a lot of people want to know, when do you rescan after furosemide? All right, so an excellent question. And I would say that it's based on your clinical findings. My patient's looking good. I usually do it about an hour. If I'm starting to see the response that I'm looking for, I usually do it about 60 minutes after starting furosemide to give that furosemide a chance to work. We can see a response earlier than that, but I like to give them at least that 60 minute window to see how that furosemide is going to impact the lung and the B lines that are there. Uh, we will, after that, then do it based on our clinical findings, and if we feel we need uh, to intervene sooner, we will, but usually it's about the 60-minute mark. Yeah, I would agree, and if that patient six, eight hours later was looking well, but there's a huge change in clinical signs, I'm going to pull out the ultrasound right now, right, and take a look and try to determine what has changed. In humans, there's actually a good literature on um, high risk of discharge from the hospital if they still have B-lines after diuresis versus diuresing them to a dry lung before discharging them home for bounce backs from heart failure. So, Yep, that's uh, awesome. Uh, a lot of people want to know what we did for scanning. Uh, do you want to talk about your protocol? Like, do you clip patients? Do you use alcohol, gel? How do you get an image? All right, so we tend not to clip. It's not wrong to clip, and certainly you can shave the patient. There's no problem in doing so, but we tend to just part the fur, make sure that we can see the skin, and that's key. If you can't see the skin, you're going to trap fur, you're going to trap air, and that's an enemy of ultrasound and gives you a poor image quality. So we do make sure that we can see the skin when we separate the fur, yeah. apply the alcohol there. And one thing that we have started to use, especially in a time that we currently live in, is an alcohol gel combination. So that gel alcohol, that's what we just scanned uh, Cypress, uh, Dr. Shalhoub's dog with. So we tend to use the gel alcohol. Uh, I'm gonna patent that as a separate name as an ultrasound product uh, and become rich off gel alcohol. Uh, so we use the uh, alcohol gel combinations or just the alcohol, separate the fur, make sure you see the skin and you will get great images. That said, if you wanna add a little bit of gel, you can just make sure you uh, don't trap any air in the fur and you can also shave if you need to, but we tend not to. We tend to just use alcohol or gel alcohol and the uh, separation of the fur. Yeah, especially that the first use for this is triage. That patient's coming in, you know, we don't have time to, to shave. We don't wanna shave either and stress that patient out. So often we're just gonna go ahead and part the fur, put alcohol or gel and boom, there we are. What do you guys think about the image quality on a handheld, uh, specifically like the Clarius? And um, is it one, do you use the same probe for the lung and cardiac imaging or other applications? Or are there multiple probes that you use? Yeah, so I think, I think the image quality speaks for itself. Everyone just saw it. I mean, it's incredible. And it's so, the great thing about it is how portable it is and everything goes right um, to a cloud system, which I really like. It's great for me for teaching images because then I could just pull them off really quickly instead of having to put a USB key to the machine. Um, what we use, we use the microconvex curvilinear probe for every single application of poor endocrine ultrasound. We rarely put out a linear probe. You certainly can, um, but for point of care ultrasound, most of the time we're using a microconvex curvilinear probe because of its multi-frequency capability. Yeah, and you gotta keep in mind again, we're doing emergency questions and assessments. So the microconvex does everything. 
If we were looking for something really subtle or we wanted to find smaller details, then we might reach for the linear in that setting to really get, get a resolution. Mm -hmm. But that resolution is not usually required for us to answer the point of query uh, questions that we want to answer in the ECC setting. So the uh, microconvex C7 that, that we have that we use today is more than enough. And usually we will just set that to abdomen. We don't even usually go to cardiac all the time. No. Uh, we, the one that you saw that we just did the demo on Cyprus was set for medium uh, animal. Abdomen. So, yeah. and we didn't uh, set it for cardiac. You certainly could do that, but we don't always need to. Yeah. Um, and so we did demos on dogs. Uh, a lot of the talk was on cats. There's a lot of questions about, is it the same protocol for dogs? What's different? What's the same? Uh, if you could speak a couple minutes to that. Yeah, it's very similar. The big difference in cats are we gonna use the same probe or just we're gonna be less deep, that's for sure. So you wanna think about that potentially when you start scanning is to reduce your depth. And so for cats, often you're just gonna put the probe at a specific angle, usually short axis to the heart, and you're right at the sternum, you're gonna see the mushroom. And often all you need to do is fan the probe and boom, you have your left atrium aortic ratio. So almost like maybe a, a pediatric patient or on, right? Like where you don't really don't have to sweep up and down the heart compared to a big dog, like a Dalmatian or a Doberman, where you really have like centimeters and centimeters of heart to sweep up and down to go find that LAU. Or a Great Dane. Or a Great Dane. Or an Irish Wolfhound. Thank you. Just thinking bigger than a Dalmatian. That's sort of a medium for a dog. Well, so, but yes, exactly the same questions are asked and answered. The protocol is identical that we use in our cats that we do in our dogs. We're actually, uh, I just wrote a chapter for uh, a group in uh, Massimo, um, and he's got a book coming out just on feline emergency critical care management. And uh, we wrote the book chapter for that too. And exactly the same protocol in cats as dogs. But like yep. Sir said, things are smaller. So your movements are more subtle, uh, but otherwise it's the same. Do you guys look at things like plural irregularities? I know we didn't really cover that today, but in terms of infectious versus non-infectious, I know like in humans, for instance, especially with COVID, pulmonary ultrasound became a big thing. And we're looking at a lot of plural irregularities. And I'm actually curious if, if there's been COVID in animals and if you can detect that with the ultrasound too, but that may be a fringe topic. So we focus on the plural irregularity. We, we have not seen any COVID positive patients. We have not scanned any, uh, but yes, we are, CERN and I are sp specifically looking at plural irregularities um, because we have read the human literature. So for instance, with congestive heart failure, their, their blood tends to be more smooth versus infectious where it's going to be much more irregular. Um, so we have looked at it and so far, mind you, it's great for evidence. We have not you know, collected enough data, but we want to. Um, we have certainly seen that hold true so far in veterinary medicine. So patients coming for congestive heart failure, their pleura is going to be pretty smooth where those beelines are going to come from, eh? Absolutely. A hundred percent agree with you. And uh, we do actually have a nice talk that has the progression from beelines to pleural irregularities, to subpleural consolidations, to actual lung consolidations, going through the shreds and uh, translobars and so forth. Uh, we're again, happy to come back and do another talk. Um, but we do look for the plural regularity yep. as well. I'm not sure you're going to be able to answer this, but it, it's kind of brought up by a few people on how do you kind of prioritize your target? I'm trying to summarize it into one question. How do you prioritize the target of care? If you see significant plural effusion, enlarged left atrium, maybe a pericardial effusion too, in terms of what do you target first? Do you do furosemide or thoracentesis first, or how do you decide? Great question. So if it's a cat, you tend to play the odds. That cat's likely going to have more pulmonary edema because of that enlarged left atrium. And the pleural effusion often is not necessarily the big cause of the dyspnea tachypnea. So often it's going to be furosemide. And then I'm going to reevaluate that patient if that patient is getting better, potentially I'm going to do thoracosynthesis. But that is a stressful procedure, right? Versus giving furosemide IV, much less stressful. If clinically I judge that there is a significant amount of pleural effusion, then maybe I'm going to have to give furosemide and at the same time some sedation. Um, well, maybe that anxiolytic we're talking about to tap that pleural effusion to stabilize that cat. But in cats, they usually get non clinically significant uh, pericardial effusion. So, what I mean by that compared to dogs that can get tamponade um, and changes in their, in, their, in their pressures of the heart, cats tend to not. So, often that pericardial effusion we're going to see in cats from congestive heart failure from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is not something that we need to tap or that we should tap, but it is another indicator potentially that we have heart disease. Absolutely. And I would hundred percent agree. It comes down to your clinical assessment. And if my patient comes in with the pleural fusion and I assess it to be mild, again, I would start the furosemide as well. And I hundred percent agree. It's incredibly rare that we need to tap a pericardial fusion in a cat with congestive heart failure. It's usually an incidental finding. 
Uh, if my patient's showing evidence of tamponade, different story, then yes, it becomes clinical and we do tap it in that scenario. But if there's no evidence of tamponade, then we're not going to tap it. Um, 100% agree. I'm going to squeeze one more question in, uh, which is how long does it take to get competent at scanning? Say maybe, you know, the way we think about it for human, the human practitioners is how many scans do you think you need to do before you can start making clinical calls? And what do you guys recommend is the best way to achieve that competency? All right. So I'm going to say that we actually did do a research project with one of our fourth year veterinary students, Dr. Jantina McMurray, and came to the conclusion based on her different chunks, you can get proficient in point of care ultrasound in as little as 20 scans. And that was for the abdomen and the thorax. So Boom. <laughs> that's, that's, great. Great. that's yeah. where we had it. Well, um, well, and yeah. I will also say that if you want to know what I think is the best way to actually get proficient at it, it's to attend a hands-on session in addition to the lectures. The lectures Practice. are great. But then it's going to be attending a hands-on session to get a, an exact feel for where you are. And then, like Sir said, you got to start scanning everything you can get your hands scanning. on. Scanning. And don't wait for the sick patients to scan. Scan the normal patient. Start with the abdomen. Get comfortable with yes and no. There's no uh, effusion or anything. And then move on to the pearl space and lung and then do the heart. Um, I, for instance, three, four years ago, I never touched the heart. I was terrified of the heart. Um, I had never really scanned a heart. And Sir, in the lab, said, okay, Sir, today you're, you're teaching the heart literally put me there and I, I was able to pick up most of it and teach it. And now you can't get him off. I the love heart. the heart. Uh, but uh, that's it. Uh, I agree. And the other really nice thing you can do, if you get an elective surgery in your dogs or cats, while they're still under anesthesia before you're executing them, so they're still under complete um, control, that's a great uh, situation where you're going to have abdominal fluid and you're going to have free abdominal air. Those are great patients to scan, to pick up those small amounts of fluids and that free abdominal air, or if you happen to, most people aren't going to do uh, uh, surgery of the chest that frequently, but in practice, for sure, your elective abdominal procedures, ovarian hysterectomy, et cetera, great patients to scan for fluid and air in the abdomen. Yep. Perfect model. Wow, just 20 scans. That is phenomenal. We are now just past the 15 minute mark for our bonus live Q&A. If we didn't get to your question and there were dozens, we will follow up with you by email in the coming week. Again, you'll all receive a copy of the webinar recording by email this week and a link to the uh, presentation PDF. Please do complete our closing survey to give us feedback so we can continue to bring you great educational content like we did today. I'd like to conclude by thanking Dr. Boyson and Dr. Shaloub. Thank you as well to all of you for joining us today. I've had so much fun. I hope you had as much fun as we did. And we hope to see you all again very soon. Thank you so much. Everybody. Thank you, everyone.